Shalom. Welcome back. Uh, it's been a while. I um, I had an occasion to, to make a video uh, this week, so I thought I um, I would just put together a quick screencast, um, share some thoughts on an article. It's an article that was sent to me. Uh, I signed up for for the uh, social media site Gab. And Gab is like a um, it's like a free speech version version of Facebook. Um, there is no censorship censorship at all on Gab. It um, and it can be kind of like the Wild West at times. You know, people will say some very politically incorrect stuff. Um, it really is you know no holds barred type of thing. But um, but they send out a newsletter every few days, and it comes to my email box and. Um, they sent out this article against the modern Judaizers, and it was written by this guy, uh, Shane Schetzel, I guess is how you say his name. He is a ethnically Jewish person, but he's a Christian. And he is criticizing people who talk about the pagan origins of, of Christmas. Um... I'll tell you where my family is on this. Like I've uh, I've put together some videos in the past about the pagan origins and the pagan trappings that that are associated with Christmas. You know, the Christmas tree and the reefs and the Yule log and all this pagan stuff. Um, for a long time, my family celebrated Hanukkah, uh, but then some information came to light that made me have to rethink doing Hanukkah. Um, yeah, I. For one thing, you know, Hanukkah really is just a Jewish, like a Jewish national holiday type of thing. But um, one of the things that happened in the days of the Maccabees is that that was when the Zadokite priests were run out of the temple and were replaced with the, um, you know, these these false priests, and that's when the calendar got changed and a bunch of kind of nefarious stuff went down. And I really didn't want to be uh, celebrating Hanukkah. I didn't want to be celebrating the uh, one something that's really just more for the for the Jewish people. Um, I don't consider myself a, a you know a Jew. I, I consider myself a member of of Israel because that's what believers in Yeshua are. We are Israel. Um, and and I didn't want to celebrate the whole shenanigans that went on at the temple. So we quit doing. Hanukkah, and uh, currently what we're doing is we're doing just, um, we are giving our kids presents on the 25th of December, so we're doing kind of like this non-religious Christmas, I guess you could call it, like we don't have, you know, Christmas trees, we don't do Santa Claus, we don't do any of the pagan stuff, we just, um, I, I really didn't see the difference between giving our kids gifts on the day of Hanukkah versus giving our kids gifts on the day of Christmas, so... That's where we are on it. Um, I have been going to a Christian church. Um, you know, sat down with the pastor the day we, the first day we went there, and I explained to him all my, uh, you know, unorthodox beliefs about about Paul and scripture not being um, scripture not being inerrant. And um, I mean, we had like several hour long conversations. So, you know, the pastor knows where I stand on everything, and. He's even told me that he's going to allow me to start doing some teachings in February. They're going to start a uh, Wednesday night service, and he wants me to to do some presentations on uh, on some of the information I shared with him. And um, we're probably going to start off talking about uh, just like hearing God's voice and that sort of thing. So, you know, good things are happening. But um, this article went out, and I read the article. It's written by this guy Shane Shane Schetzel. I guess is how you say his name. Uh, he is a ethnically Jewish person who is a Christian, and he's got a real chip on his shoulder for people who want to talk about the pagan origins of Christmas. And this article was so poorly written, so poorly researched, and so misrepresentative of the position of people who don't do the pagan stuff for Christmas that I felt the need, like, okay, you know, I, I actually wrote to the CEO of Gab and I asked if I could make a rebuttal. And he hasn't answered me back. I wrote him a couple more times about it. Um, I ended up writing the rebu rebuttal. And so what I really want to do is just um, 
I want to read this article if I can make it through it without without losing my mind, and then I'll uh, I'll read to you what I wrote as a rebuttal and probably share some additional comments too. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff goes out around the Christmas season because we are making an impact by pointing out the the pagan origins of this stuff, and it upsets Christians and. They really don't have an answer to it. Like you're going to see here in this article that, you know, you, you can see the words on the screen. And he starts out acting like he's going to defend Christmas against these, um, you know, people who, who say that it's simulating ancient pagan worship. But he doesn't. <laughs> he, he builds up like he's going to, like that's going to be. And, and in fact, he even concludes his article talking about this again. But he doesn't address it. And um, Gab actually sent out another article that did the same thing. And I just, I thought it was funny. Um, so I'll, I'll th this is the other article that came out like two days later. Um, so, you know, it starts off with, it is usual for the Christmas season to be a joyous occasion filled with so much to appreciate, yada, yada, yada. Um but at the same time, there's a consistent and often predictable amount of voices whose sole purpose is to cause chaos and discord during these holiest days that we Christians celebrate. Of course, this happens with every Christian holiday or feast, but it often comes to a fever pitch around Christmas. We as Christians are bombarded with constant horrible and false arguments claiming various Christmas traditions are pagan or that Christmas itself or Christ himself is just a hodgepodge of pagan practices with a Jewish spin. I'm sure you've all had these familiar arguments with someone you know. While I think it's useful to combat these tired statements and arguments, often others have done a far more thorough job than I could ever do. So, I'm, so I decided it would be best to focus on an entirely different aspect. So it's like, okay, and he goes on with this long article. This is not the article that, that this video is actually a rebuttal to. But I just I just thought it was so funny. Like, he, he builds this up. Like, I'm going to tell you about, uh, you know, about these false statements about how Christmas traditions are pagan. But then he doesn't do it. And so this is, you know, this other article, the original article that I was making this rebuttal to, um, does the same thing. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is they really don't have a defense. Their their defense is always like okay well yes it it's the origins of Christian of Christmas come from pagan worship but you know we're all Gentiles and so we're allowed to have some pagan stuff and God doesn't care and <laughs> which is completely false because he says repeatedly in the scriptures that he does care and we're not Gentiles anymore if you're a Christian you're Israel you're not you're not a Gentile you're not a heathen. So you shouldn't keep your heathen practices. But um, but I'm going to go ahead and read this. This is the actual article that I wanted to rebut. Um, and you know, I wrote to the Gap CEO. I, I told him I wanted to write a rebuttal. He hasn't answered me back yet. Um, but because I did write the rebuttal, um, I did want to actually get it out there. So this is how I'm going to do it. Um, <clears throat> so, Mr. Shane Schetzel starts out and says, is the celebration of Christmas pagan? What about the celebration of Easter? Is it pagan too? Certainly the celebration of Halloween must be pagan, right? How about worshiping God on Sundays? Surely that is pagan, no? Is it all some big conspiracy? Are the historical churches of Christendom, Christendom secretly trying to simulate ancient pagan worship while fooling us all into believing this honors Jesus Christ? These are the sorts of questions that permeate our modern culture and what they amount to collectively is an outright and direct assault on Christianity. The objective behind these attacks is to undermine our Christian culture, fracture, fracture it, balkanize it, and then replace it with something more distinctively Jewish in appearance. While I could go on, while I could go into the errors behind each specific attack on each individual subject, as I have in the past, I think there's a much bigger or, uh, or overarching problem in play here. What all these individual attacks really amount to is Judaizing. 
I submit to you that the modern church, much like the early church, has a significant problem with Judaizing. And we are all seeing it play out here with each and every attack that is made against traditional Christianity and traditional Christian culture. The biblical definition of a Judaizer is a Christian who attempts to bind other Christians to the Old Testament Mosaic law. It is probably the oldest Christian heresy. We first learn about the Judaizers in Acts of the Apostles chapter 15, which records how certain Jewish Christians, meaning Jews who had converted to Christianity, were telling non-Jewish or Gentile Christians that they needed to be circumcised in order to remain as Christians. Circumcision is the initiation ritual into the Old Covenant Law of Moses. A man cannot be a practitioner of ancient Jewish religion or modern Judaism unless he is first circumcised. And it is the first of many steps along the path. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't. That That's not true. Um, it is not the first step. It is the last step. So, like, if you were a Gentile and you were to convert to Judaism... You would go through, there, there's a process to it, and I'm not an expert on the process, but I do know this. I do know that um, at first you're discouraged by the rabbi from becoming a Jew, and if you, you know, kind of, you know, push on through with the with him telling you, no, you don't want to be a Jew or whatever, and, and you remain persistent about wanting to convert, um, then you're kind of... You kind of take on this almost like a uh, like a discipleship type of thing, where you know the the rabbi or one of the elders of the synagogue will kind of educate you and and lead you into understanding Judaism, and then the very last step is you get circumcised. That's the last step, not the first step. <clears throat> so you know right away you can tell that, that this person doesn't really understand the problem. Now in the first century. There was a group called the Sakari, and the Sakari, um, if they heard a Gentile even talking about the Torah, they would uh, follow him and wait till he was alone, and then they would basically kind of ambush him and forcibly circumcise him. <laughs> so, um, if you can imagine that. Um, <clears throat> so, the, what's at play in, in Acts 15 is some people in the synagogue who are possibly now now you know the book of acts does say that they were pharisees but it's possible that maybe they had some kind of association with the sakari and they were proposing something similar like okay well if somebody's going to be joining our new religion um you know they didn't call it Christianity back then but if, if you wanted to become one of the ebionites which or, or a follower of the way then you should be circumcised. And so that was the debate in Acts 15. Um, and so, you know, the, if they were pushing that these new converts had to be circumcised because they were going to be, you know, talking about the Torah, then that, that was kind of the issue, right? Um, but anyway, I'll get back to the reading. So it says, Circumcision is the initiation right into the Old Covenant of Moses. A man cannot be a practitioner of the ancient Jewish religion, or Judaism, unless he is first circumcised, and is the first of many steps along this path. Again, it's not the first step, it's the last. It doesn't end with circumcision, it never does. Circumcision is just the first step. What follows is keeping kosher, worshiping on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday, observing the Mosaic feast, Passover, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and booths, as well as the Maccabean feast of Hanukkah. In other words, circumcision is an initiation ceremony into a whole way of life, a Jewish way of life. As one can imagine, this caused quite a stir in the early church, which led to the church's first ecumenical council known as the Council of Jerusalem, again recorded in Acts 15. I encourage you to read the account for yourself. Yes, I mean, I encourage you to read it for yourself too, (laughs) because apparently the the, the author of this article did not read it himself. Um, In whatever Bible translation you prefer, I just outline the highlights here. In the 15th chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 5, we learn about this dispute in the early church. The Judaizers made their case that Gentile Christians could not be saved unless they first became practitioners of the old Mosaic law. 
This would be initiated by circumcision. When Paul and Barnabas came to Jerusalem to discuss this with the elders of the early church, they were immediately confronted by the Judaizers among the Christians in Jerusalem, who said very boldly, in quotes, <laughs> so, so notice this is a, you know, there's quote, quotation marks here. Unless the Gentile converts to Christianity are circumcised, they cannot be saved. Now, go to Acts 15.5 and see if you can find that quotation. So, like, this guy, is, he's misquoting scripture. Um, it'd be, like, if you're going to paraphrase, that's fine. Like, I, I think that typically if you're going to paraphrase, you should put, like, the, the single apostrophes, not the double quotation marks like this. But, but either way, like, he doesn't. <laughs> he... He, he puts it in there with quotation marks like he's quoting from the scripture and he's not. But anyway, he says, Acts 15.5 specifically says that these Christians were ethnic Jews who still belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Acts 15.6-21 recounts the proceedings of the council in Jerusalem in detail. The apostle Peter specifically recalled that he had preached to the Gentiles himself and placed no such burden on them. Those familiar with the Acts of the Apostles will recount Peter's dealings with the Gentiles in Acts uh, in, in chapter 10, wherein he received a vision of many unclean animals and God's voice telling him to rise up, kill, and eat. Peter himself gives his interpretation of this vision in his following actions. The unclean animals represent the Gentiles, and the eating is not a command for Peter to break his kosher dietary habits, but rather to begin associating with Gentiles bringing them into the church as fellow Christians without putting the requirement of the Mosaic law upon them. Well, he does get the first part right. I mean, he, you know, this, this is better than most, um, than most Christians will. You know, they'll say that, no, that Peter was being told he could eat anything. Um, but at least the author of this article does realize that this was not about food. It was about, you know, the Gentiles. <clears throat> Acts 15 22 through 35 recounts the council's final decision to allow Gentiles to come into the church as Gentiles without requiring that they keep the law of Moses. A letter was sent to Gentile Christians with the following instruction. The Judaizers do not have any authority from the church in Jerusalem. You may ignore them. Listen to Paul and Barnabas instead. Abstain from participating in idolatry. Don't drink animal blood. Don't eat bloody or strangled meat. And don't engage in sexual immorality. That was it. That was the Council of Jerusalem put no further obligations on the non Jewish, aka Gentile Christians. We see Paul deal with the Judaizing heresy again multiple times throughout his epistles in the New Testament. Um, the bottom line is this Christians can be ethnic, ethnically Jewish or ethnically Gentile. One's race or ethnicity or even one's culture is irrelevant. It is forbidden, however, to impose the law of Moses on Gentile Christians. In any way, Christianity is not to be an ethno-religion overriding Gentile cultures with Jewish culture, but rather a universal faith for people of all races, ethnicities, and cultures. The ancient Greeks had a, world, a word for such universalism. It was an adjective called katholikos, and it translates to universal, meaning not tied to any particular race, ethnicity, or culture. It is where we get the English word Catholic. Acts 15 says Christianity is a catholicos, or universal faith for all people. Gentiles need not adopt the precepts of the law of Moses or Jewish culture to be good Christians. The word catholicos was first recorded in AD 105 by Ignatius in his letter to the Smyrnans. Ignatius was a bishop of the early church in Antioch and a direct disciple of the Apostle John. He was martyred that same year in the Colosseum in Rome, mauled by lions. So, um, anyway, like you, you notice he's not quoting any scriptures here. He's just, you know, he, he's making a bunch of, of statements um, about what Christianity is or what it's supposed to be, but he has no scriptural support for any of this. This leads us to another word you won't find in the Bible or the writings of the early Christians, but later coined to succinctly describe what the early Christians were doing in the first few centuries of the church history. That word is enculturation. Enculturation describes the process of Christianity absorbing cultures as it advanced from place to place in the ancient world. 
The idea behind it is based on the events recorded in Acts 15. Rather than steamrolling over Gentile court cultures with religious precepts that demand a culture adapt to it, which is exactly what the Pharisees did, Islam does it too. Uh-oh, there's guilt by association. Now we're you know bringing Islam into it, just like these terrible Hebrew Christians. Christianity absorbs a culture and baptizes it, so to speak, preserving what is good and wholesome, or at least harmless about the culture, while eliminating those things that are idolatrous or immoral. Now, <laughs> so, uh, according to this author, um, he is saying that the pagan roots, the, the you know, the Christmas tree and, and the all the the reefs and the fertility symbols, as well as the pagan symbology in Easter. He's saying that they are not, that they are good and wholesome, or at least harmless, and that they are not idolatrous or immoral. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind that the Christmas tree itself and the, uh, the reefs are fertility symbols um, used in um, religious ceremonies involving uh, temple prostitutes, and that the colored eggs are they come from pagan practices of slaughtering infants and dipping the eggs in the blood of the infants as a type of uh, fertility rite. So, um, there's, no, there's nothing wholesome about m- memorializing the killing of infant children and coloring eggs with their blood. I, I'm sorry, like, I just. I just, I just have to say that. Um, this is how Europe was made. It's also how Russia was made. It's also how the Middle Eastern and North African uh, Christian cultures were made before they were steamrolled by Islam. More recently, we see the principle of enculturation applied to the Americas over the last 500 years, and we are only beginning to see it applied to the sub-Saharan and Far Eastern cultures now. Enculturation based on the principle laid down in Acts 15 is how Christianity baptizes and redeems different Gentile cultures, preserving them and making them into a tapestry that is called Christendom. Again, no... Not you know, no mention, no tying anything into scripture, no quoting Jesus or the apostles for any of this. It's just you know, this is what uh, I guess this guy is is mandating for uh, Christian Christianity. Of course, the question arises: What gave the apostles the authority to do this? <laughs> well, first of all, the apostles didn't do it. Um, this brings up another word not found in the Bible, but describes a very biblical concept called supersessionalism. This is commonly misunderstood by Christian doctrine. Many Christians believe it means that Gentile Christians have replaced the Jews as a chosen people of God. Um, yes, that's exactly what it means, by the way. Uh, that's a drastic oversimplification. That is incorrect. What it truly means is that the new covenant in Christ has superseded the old covenant in Moses. That means there is neither Jew nor Gentile, metaphorically speaking, under the new covenant. It is open to anyone, and you don't have to change your ethnicity or culture to be part of it. You certainly don't have to keep the law of Moses. Um, okay, I'm just going to try to make it through the rest of the article. But <laughs> It says, the idea here is that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled the law of Moses and nailed it with him to the cross. He, being the Word of God, is the author of the Law of Moses, and He, being the Messiah, or Christ, is the finisher of the Law of Moses as well. He didn't destroy the Law. He fulfilled it so that the rest of us wouldn't have to. The Law of Moses remains, but it remains fulfilled in Jesus Christ as His author and finisher. The rest of us fulfilled the Law of Moses by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who is our appropriation before God and the Father. The law of Moses is complete in him. It is no longer necessary, except perhaps to be loosely followed by ethnic Jews as a remembrance of Christ's fulfillment. The Apostle Paul is recorded as doing this in Acts 21, 17-26. As for non-Jews or ethnic Gentiles, the leaders of the early church strictly forbade Jewish believers from trying to Judaize them. So with this in mind... Now enters the modern Judaizers of the 21st century. Who are they? They are Christians, just like the Judaizers of ancient times. Believers in Jesus Christ who have a gross misunderstanding of what it means to be a Christian. Only this time they may or may not be ethnically Jewish. 
The definition of Judaizing is trying to make non-Jews follow the precepts of the Old Covenant or the Law of Moses. This is not the same as Jewish Christians or Hebrew Christians who are simply wanting to keep their Jewish customs within their own families as a cultural connection to their ethnic people. That in itself is a personal matter, and by definition it is not Judaizing. No modern Judaizers are Christians, whether Jewish or not. Um who try to convince other Christians that in order to please God, they must keep various aspects of the law of Moses. <clears throat> Each Judaizing group has its own particular agenda. For some, it's about worshiping on Saturday or the Sabbath rather than Sunday. For others, it's about keeping the Jewish feast of Hanukkah instead of Christmas or Passover instead of Easter. For some, it's about wearing Jewish clothing or celebrating Jewish liturgy. In others, it's about exclusively using Hebrew words to refer to God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and things of a Christian nature. For many, it's a combination of all these things. Nearly all of them, however, have one thing in common. They attack and malign the traditional celebrations of Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, and worship on Sundays. They usually spout elaborate conspiracy theories to back their claims, theories about the supposed pagan origins of these Christian traditions. Many of them are terribly oversimplified, and some of them are just plain wrong. I won't, I won't go into these errors here, because they are too many to account for. And again, <laughs> like it, it's so ridiculous. Um, these are the modern Judaizers, and they're not much different from the ancient Judaizers. They fail to understand the basic apostolic concept from Acts 15. That Christianity is a universal or catholicos faith that is built on an enculturation of Gentile cultures and a supersession of the Old Covenant. It is not, and was never intended to be, a faith that mirrors the Old Covenant law of Moses or even Judaism. The Judaizers were wrong in the first century, and they're wrong in the 21st century as well. The Apostle Paul was very stern with them in the New Testament. He never wasted the opportunity to rebuke their errors and correct them. We should likewise learn from his example. So, you know, I think that's probably the most important um, few lines in this entire um, tirade against people who keep, you know, the actual instructions in the Bible. Um, it all comes down to Paul, like you know, the apostate Paul. Um, you know, he, he is this, this author's um, inspiration. And notice that these, these words, supersession, enculturation, um, Judaizers, <laughs> like none of these words appear in Scripture. He even goes so far as to say uh, somewhere, he says, the biblical definition of Judaizers is blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there it is. The biblical definition of a Judaizer is a Christian who attempts to bind other Christians to the Old Testament Mosaic law. Well, um, I'd like to know how he gets a biblical definition for a word that's not in the Bible. Now, Judaize is in the Bible. It's said one time by the apostate Paul to Peter, and in that same passage in um, Galatians chapter 2, um, Paul also admits that everybody turned against him. That even Barnabas, even his traveling companion, was uh, turned against him. So, it appears that what happened in Galatians chapter 2 is that um, Paul was the one that re was rebuked, not, not Peter. And in fact, if you read the book of Galatians and you compare it to the epistle from James, James, the brother of Yeshua, the brother of Jesus, then you will see that um, the the epistle of James is actually a like a reply to the book of Galatians. So, um, so uh, like basically, like the way this whole thing went down, from what I understand, is that um, something happened in Antioch, where Peter had come to Antioch and he was eating with the Gentiles. And some people came from James. And when the people arrived from James, Peter would no longer eat with the Gentiles. Now, we don't really know what the issue is. All we know is that Paul said that he was Judaizing. Um, I think Peter probably got some information he wasn't aware of. Namely, I think he found out that, that Paul had not accurately delivered the message about the expectations 
of the Gentiles from James. And we'll, we'll look at that when we talk about Acts 15. And when Paul, or when, I'm sorry, when Peter found out that, that Paul did not deliver that message, or at least not the full message, that he withdrew himself. And that that's where this uh, altercation occurred between Peter and Paul. And Paul admits that everybody turned against him. But we don't really know the details of it. All we know is what Paul says. Afterwards, Paul writes Galatians. And if you read Galatians with this information, then you know, you can tell that Paul is trying to do some damage control. And so when he writes this letter uh, to the Galatians to do his damage control, then James sends a reply. He sends a rebuttal in much the same way that I am. And so that's the true story of, of what was going on with Paul there. And if you want more information about that, I made a series of videos that goes into depth on that, and that is um, just look on my YouTube channel, uh, David Hunotsuri, and uh, or just type in uh, "What's up with Galatians" and it should come up on your your search there at YouTube. But um, the series "What's up with Galatians" goes into what was going on between Paul and James and Peter. <clears throat> okay, so here's my rebuttal. This is the rebuttal that I offered to send to the CEO of Gab. And uh, he, he may answer me back, um, you know, Monday. And if he does, I'll go ahead and send it to him. But this is the, the rebuttal I made. On December 21st, 2021, Gab News sent out an email with a post written by Shane Shaitzel. Um, his screen name is Complete Christianity at Gab. He was a Christian of Jewish heritage, is what the uh, email said. And the article is entitled Against the Modern Judaizers. I read the article from Mr. Schetzel, and will be completely honest. I found this article to be dishonest and offensive to the Christians who seek to follow the scripture as written. I would like to set the record straight on a number of fallacies that Mr. Schetzel asserted in his article, which was really just a hit piece against other Christians. <clears throat> For the record, I'm not opposed to observing Christmas. I am simply opposed to the pagan elements that have been associated with this day decorated trees, Santa Claus, etc. I am not opposed to observing Resurrection Sunday. I am simply opposed to the pagan elements that have become associated with this day. The name Easter is the name of a pagan fertility goddess, decorated eggs, bunnies, etc. So again, this is what I explained at the beginning of my video. Um, honestly, I just I see Hanukkah as just a substitute, like a Jewish version of Christmas. And it's like, and like I said earlier, earlier in the video, it does, you know, if you're going to do one, you might as well do the other. Like it doesn't matter. So, um, so, you know, now we just, the, the way that my practice has evolved now, currently, you know, we do give the kids gifts on the 25th of December, but we don't do, you know, the whole Christmas thing. Um, the article opens with several questions on whether the celebration of Christmas, Easter, and Halloween are pagan. Mr. Schaetzel states that merely asking these questions amounts to an outright and direct assault on Christianity. And that is a quote. If you believe that merely asking a question is an outright and direct assault on your beliefs, perhaps you are afraid of examining your beliefs to see if they line up with scriptural truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's John 14.6. Is it possible to be a follower of, quote, the truth, end quote, if we are walking in falsehoods? Would merely examining the practices of our faith be an attack on our faith if we are walking in truth? The Apostle Peter tells us, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15 it sounds like Peter wasn't afraid to answer the difficult questions that one might ask about his faith. Should we not do the same? Mr. Schaetzel asserts that the objective behind these attacks is to undermine our Christian culture, fracture it, balkanize it, and then replace it with something distinctively more Jewish in appearance. 
This assertion is almost laughable, as in it's been a great deal of time in fellowships with literally hundreds of Christians who do not observe the pagan traditions Mr. Schaetzel is so protective of. None of these Christians had a goal to do what he alleges. The goal of every single one of the Christians whom I know who reject the pagan traditions is to align themselves with what God wants. Is Yahweh our God? Is Jesus our King? If so, should we not honor them, thorough, honor them through our obedience? <clears throat> so this is one of the things I objected to, is this whole like, straw man argument saying that, oh, these people are, are, are exposing these pagan traditions with the purpose of undermining Christianity. And that's not the purpose. That's not anyone's purpose. <laughs> you know, the, the reason that people are doing that is because we are trying to align ourselves with what God desires. Mr. Schaetzel never refutes that the holidays mentioned are rooted in paganism. I found it to be a bit strange that he said, I go into the airs behind every specific attack. I could go into the airs behind every specific attack, but he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't address a single supposed error in what people says. In fact, he spends a great deal of time later in the article admitting that the early church absorbed the cultures of the Gentile or pagan nations as it spread. From what I understood, Mr. Schaetzel's point of, was that even though these holidays are rooted in paganism, he doesn't think there's anything wrong with it. And that is, honestly, that is what I came away from reading his article. That's what I came away with, my understanding of the way he feels. <clears throat> Mr. Schaetzel did not offer any scriptural evidence that it's okay to celebrate pagan feasts in God's name. It's fairly easy to find numerous verses that refute this claim, though. Deuteronomy 12 absolutely forbids a believer in the God of the Bible from using a pagan practice to worship him. Deuteronomy 12, too. And all of my scriptural quotes in this article are from um, the King James Version because... This is being written to Christians, and so I know that's the version, the scriptural translation that, that is most universally accepted by them. So if you're wondering why I'm using this instead of my typical translation, that's why. Ye shall, ye shall utterly destroy all the, all the places where in the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. Let's uh, underline that. And you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. We'll underline that one too. And you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names out of the place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Underline. Boom. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them after that which they destroyed from before thee. And that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination which the Lord hates have they done unto their gods. Even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things, so, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. <clears throat> so again, you know, this, this example here that um, from the book of Deuteronomy, this is why God doesn't want us taking the traditions of these pagan nations, is because in God's eyes, like he's seen them burn their sons and daughters in the fire. He has seen the baby slaughtered Easter Sunday when they were dipping the eggs in the blood. He's seen this, and that's what he associates these tra traditions with. Jeremiah describes something that sounds awfully similar to a Christmas tree, which we are forbidden from practicing. Jeremiah 10, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are in vain. One cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the woodsmen, with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. 
they must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Or you can simply do a Bible search for green tree, groves, pillar, and find lots and lots of verses where God commands us not to use these pagan practices to honor him. Next, Mr. Schatzel claims that the early church had a significant problem with Judaizing, and he even offers up a biblical definition of a Judaizer. Someone should tell Mr. Schatzel that the word Judaizer does not appear in the Bible so he might have a difficult time proving that that is a, quote, biblical definition, end quote. The term Judaize does appear in some translations where Paul publicly challenged the Apostle Peter for, uh, for compelling Gentile converts to early Christianity to Judaize in Galatians 2.14. It's worth noting that we do not have Peter's side of the story, and we also don't fully know how what the issue was. We also don't fully know what the issue was exactly, but this challenge did not go well. Did not work out well for Paul. He admits that everyone was on Peter's side, including Barnabas. Mister Shaisel says, "We first learn about the Judaizers in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Go ahead and read chapter, uh, read Acts 15, and see if you can find the word Judaizers. You won't find it there." The exchange in Acts 15 is about a debate in Antioch about whether you have to be circumcised to be saved. When Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem, the debate evolved into whether or not it was needful to circumcise new believers and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 5. Okay, so uh, let me pull up my Bible translator here, or my Bible program. It's not a translator. <laughs> um, Acts 15. Boom. Okay. So where are we at? Verse 5. Okay, so see I had um, I actually quoted the actual verse. You know, in, um, Mr. Shatesel did not. He misquoted it. So about whether it was needful to circumcise new believers and command them to keep the law of Moses. So, okay, so what I'm saying here is that the debate evolved, okay? So originally it was, um, unless you're circumcised according to the practice of Moses, you are unable to be saved. Next, um, by the time they get to Jerusalem, it has evolved into it's necessary to circumcise them and to keep the Torah of Moses. So that's that's what I was saying here. Um, James, the brother of Jesus, and again, I use the term Jesus because I'm writing this to Christians. James, the brother of Jesus, is the leader of the assembly, and he makes the final decree that, in verse 19, we do not cause trouble for those from the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols, from acts of sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood, from that... For from ancient generations, Moses has those who preach him in every city, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. This was completely left off of Mr. Shaitzel's article. In fact, um, let me find it. He said, he even says, that was it. The council put no further obligations on the non-Jewish Gentile Christians, and that's an outright lie. He did like it's it's right here in black and white. Um. So he said through verse thirty-five. I think thirty-five is when they actually went and. Um. Okay, so here is. Therefore, I judge we should not trouble those men among the Gentiles turning to Elohim. And here they sh now keep in mind it says from those who are turning. So this is a brand new convert. This is somebody who is who is just deciding to take the first step. This is not someone who is a full fledged member of the congregation. Um, that they are to we write to him that they are to abstain from these things because. 
from ancient generations, Moses has in every city those proclaiming him being read in the congregation every Sabbath. So he says no further obligations, but obviously there was further obligations. They were to hear Moses read every week. Back to my rebuttal. Did you catch that last part? If there are new believers who are turning to God, in other words, brand new believers, give them these basic commands to start off with, and then they will come into full obedience when they hear the law of Moses, when they hear Moses read every week in the synagogue. We should know that James would never override obedience to God's law because that would have been contrary to what Jesus himself said, as we're about to read. <clears throat> Mr. Schatzel edited out the end of James's ruling because that runs contrary to his assertion that Christians should not obey God's commands from the Old Testament. He goes on to say that Jesus didn't destroy the law, he fulfilled it so the rest of us wouldn't have to. This is an absolutely false statement and is contradicted directly by Jesus himself. Matthew 5.17, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, until heaven and earth are passed away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches him, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Did you catch that? Until heaven and earth pass away. If you look out your window and see the earth still outside, Jesus says the law is still in effect. In fact, your obedience to the law determines your status in the kingdom of heaven. Those are Jesus' words, words in red. <clears throat> Again, now I've heard some people say, well, this is only for Jews, but that's not what he says. He says, whoever. He doesn't say any Jew, therefore, who breaks one of the least. He says, whoever. That includes everyone. Um... Some people will say that, well, when Jesus said it was finished out on the cross, that everything was fulfilled. But obviously everything is not fulfilled. At this point, um, you know, when Jesus was on the cross, the book of Revelation was not fulfilled. History is not fulfilled today. You know, <laughs> heaven and earth still stand till heaven and earth pass away. No, not a jot or tittle will pass from the law till everything is fulfilled. So again, heaven and earth have not passed away. Jesus even says that you cannot believe his words if you don't believe Moses' writings. John uh, 5, 45, Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? In other words, if you don't believe his writings, <laughs> you, Jesus doesn't understand how you could possibly believe the words that he's speaking. Mr. Schatzel says that his so-called Judaizers are attempting to bind other Christians to the Old Testament Mosaic Law. Wrong. They are simply trying to inform other Christians that Jesus bound them to the Law of God. Jesus was the original Judaizer, apparently, according to Mr. Schatzel. Mr. Schatzel finishes up his attack on believers who want to obey God by listing his various grievances with the Hebraic Roots movement. Despite his labeling all the practices he doesn't approve of as Jewish, the only true, truly Jewish custom he mentions is keeping Hanukkah. The more correct term would be scriptural. He is upset over people doing scriptural feast days and the scriptural Sabbath. Ironically, most of the practices he is upset with are practices that scripture records Jesus doing. Jesus even went to the temple for Hanukkah, or dedication, in John 10.22. For the life of me, I can't understand why a Christian would malign other Christians for obeying, obeying God, but here we are. We are all Christians, and as Christians, I don't believe we should be accusing each other of heresy by such dishonest means as introducing straw man arguments, name calling, and fa false accusations as has been done. Mr. Schatzel's post is more akin to the propaganda that the Jewish controlled news media puts out than what I would expect from a Christian. The irony in my previous sentence cannot be understated. It is like the old adage says. 
When you point a finger at someone else, you have three pointing back at you. As Christians, we should be above using dishonest tactics to, quote, win a debate, end quote. If truth is on our side, our side should prevail honestly without stooping to such tactics. Mr. Schaetzel repeatedly calls other Christians an inflammatory, derogatory term which he falsely claims is biblical. What little scripture he does quote, he twists and misquotes to fit his opinion rather than trying to accurately deliver the message that the author is trying to convey. I would urge Mr. Schaetzel to do a little self-reflection and I hope that he repents for speaking ill of his brethren. So, that is the uh, conclusion of my <laughs> rebuttal. Um, and, and what I was saying up here is, you know, Mr. Schaetzel as a um, ethnic Jew, he's he's employing a lot of the same ta- tactics that we see the the news media doing. Um, you know, you think about the straw man arguments and name calling and such that they do over anything that's not the politically correct action of of conservatives. Um, so, like, if you if you um, are against getting the vaccine, then you're like a science denier or whatever. Um, and it's, it's not that you're denying science, obviously. It is that um, you you just you have different um, you know you, you, there's different scientists out there, and there's some scientists that are being truthful about the uh, the dangers of these vaccines. For instance, um, man, that's probably going to get me ban- banned from YouTube. <laughs> Just mentioning that, but anyway, you know, like the, it's it's this uh, misrepresentation of of someone's argument, and that's what Mister Shatzel's doing here. Um. So anyway, um, I, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I know we see a lot of this kind of stuff around Christmas, and um, I haven't really been like moved to make a video. Um, I am trying to get some of my my, my channel eventually transferred over to Gab. There's um, Gab TV on there, which is kind of like Gab's version of YouTube. Um, and I think I'll be able to speak a lot more freely about stuff. And that's why I want to uh, to switch over to Gab. Um, I plan on keeping my YouTube channel up as long as I can. But um, if for some reason my channel goes away, disappears or anything at any point in the future, then uh, you can you know look me up on Gab. Um, or you can start watching me on Gab now. So anyway, I, uh, and then if, if you are watching this on Gab and you may not know where the rest of my videos are, um, I'll, I'll put a link in the description that takes you to my YouTube channel so you can find the rest of my videos. But anyway, I pray that this has been a blessing to you and, uh, hopefully I'll be, get back in the habit of making more videos. Um, and, uh, thanks for listening. Shalom.